Good morning, everyone. Today is laity. Today is laity Sunday. Everyone who is speaking today is in the bulletin. When it is your turn to speak, just come up to the podium. Sunday school. Don't forget to stay for Sunday school following today's church service. There is a class for everyone. If you need help finding a class, please see Phil Hines, our Sunday school superintendent. Fall festival is Sunday, October 31st from 4 to 6 p.m. We will have trunk or treat, games, lots of candy, and a cookie and cake walk. This will be outside two weeks from today, so get excited. We need donations for candy, cookies, cupcakes, or cakes, and we need decorated trunks. You can find more details in the weekly nutshell. Would you stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship? We are all called into ministry with our Lord. Our baptism calls us to be the body of Christ. We are called to proclaim the good news. Our Lord Jesus Christ invites all to come to share in the forgiveness. We serve one another just as Christ served us. Thank you. You may be seated. Will you please pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for this fellowship with our church, family, and friends. We thank you for this house of worship and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for all the blessings you continue to bestow upon us, including the lessons we learn through trials and hardships. Though we may have difficulty remembering, remembering to look to difficulty, remembering um, to you and for you and all things, please help us carry within our hearts an attitude of gratitude and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. Well, welcome to Laity Sunday. I know for some of you, you've been through many of these before, but uh, just to remind you, Laity Sunday is uh, a day to celebrate the laity. Uh, it's a day to give our ordained uh, members a day off. Uh, so Laura is relaxing there among you today. Um, the laity, of course, is all of us, uh, except for those who ordained. Um, and it's a time for us to celebrate the ministries of our laity, and so you're going to uh, hear about some of those today and see some of us up here talking. I, it's always interesting to me, though, to own Laity Sunday, it's, we can turn and thank our staff as well. Uh, for, them, for most of them, it's a, a day off with a couple of exceptions. I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but over the last year or so, uh, the staff have done tremendous work in how flexible they've been and continue to keep us um, mostly sane. Um, and so we thank them for that. Uh, <clears throat> so Lady Sunday can be amateur hour to a degree for us speaking, but we can't do amateur hour for music. Uh, and so uh, today our two professional musicians, Lorraine and Lee, uh, we thank them for their continued service uh, to help us lead the service today. So Laity Sunday today, we have a guest speaker. Um, and by way of introducing him, I first want to talk about why, why he even exists, uh, not as a person, but as the role that he has. Um, most of you all know the Methodist Church is a connectional church. Uh, so this is the local church, the basic form of organization for the Methodist Church. But then we're organized into a larger connection. We were organized into a district and then into a conference and then into the jurisdiction and then to the general conference. And so in all of those uh, levels, uh, we have similar roles. Uh, the, some of you know that I'm the lay leader for this church. I get to go to a lot of meetings and speak on your behalf. Uh, and Tommy, our speaker, has that same role for the corridor district. Uh, and so you'll hear from him in a few minutes. The corridor district is a little bit new most of you would remember when it was the Burlington District for us. We did most of our meetings in Burlington. One of the downsides of that is some of our nearest neighbors uh, in Person County and Durham County, uh, we almost never saw at district events like that. And so it was reorganized a few years back uh, so that we are closer to them. And, and by that stroke of luck, we're going to have Tommy with us today. We've, of course, have had people have served in the district over the years, uh, in the Burlington District in particular. Our own Mike Parker was the Burlington District lay leader for several years. Um, so as I said, our speaker today is Tommy Humphreys. Uh, you're going to hear from him in just a minute. Uh, he's a member of Long Memorial uh, Methodist Church in Roxborough. Uh, he's been our district uh, lay leader for three years. Uh, in his personal life, uh, you may have known him uh, as the clerk of court of Person County uh, for some years. Uh, and since his retirement from that, he is a, uh, in the real estate business. And so we welcome Tommy to the pulpit and to bring God's word. Hear this scripture from Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from your unclean, uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone. And give you a heart of flesh. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Wes. I appreciate that introduction. 
just a little sales pitch for the laity of the Carter District. It has been a pleasure to serve as the district lay leader. Uh, I'm in my third year. The sad thing about it, the majority of my time in the three years has been with the pandemic and people in the personal contacts and the people getting to see people on one-on-one -on -one basis has been limited. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm tickled with all what the laity have done in our district. So many programs, the Backpack Pals, tutoring students, there's food banks in our district. We're preparing meals for homelessness and doing much vision work. And I thank them all for all they do. You know, the Methodist Church support strong laity, and I appreciate that, and that's a special thing about the Methodists to me. Uh, one other thing that's coming up in January, if anyone's interested in going to annual conference, we have the lay equalization plan. The, general, the discipline of the Methodist Church requires the same number of laity as clergy at our annual conference, and last year we had to find 52 from the Carter District to make an equal number. So if any of y'all are interested, see your pastor, because that plan we'll start be working with come sometime after January. So please uh, take advantage of it if you're interested. But thank you, and I appreciate being here this morning. My topic this morning is a change of heart. Money, y'all. Not many of y'all know that on September the first, 2017, I was taken to the hospital, and by November the first, well, by September the first, they knew that I had a serious condition, and by November the first, I had a heart transplant. So my topic this morning is a change of heart, and it'll be more than just betting having a new heart, but in a new spiritual heart. So let me take you on my journey. September the 1st, 2007, was going to be a great day in my life. I'm a great big ECU fan. I graduated in ECU in 73, went there in 69. So since 69, I've been a great football fan of ECU. Well, on this day, we were playing Virginia Tech, at Virginia Tech. It was going to be the first sports or any event on campus since the mass shooting the prior year. There was going to be national coverage. Our students raised money. We were going to present a check in support of the families. And it was going to be more coverage than my school had gotten in a long time. So it was going to be a big day. My college classmate was coming up and we were going to watch it on TV. He has a second home on Lake Heiko, and after the game, we were going back to his home, and we will have a surprise birthday party for my daughter. So I was really excited about everything that was going to happen that day. I woke up that morning, and back then, this was the time we got newspapers delivered to the house. So it was a while back. But I got up that morning and was walking to the end of the driveway to get the paper. Halfway down the driveway, I lost my breath. And I got mad at myself. I said, Tommy, you're an excitable person, but don't get that excited to go for a ball game. So I thought I was just hyper. I got the paper, went back, and had breakfast and was telling my wife. And she said, well, do you need to go to the hospital? I said, no, I just need to settle down. So as the morning went on, I got a little better. And I said, well, maybe, you know, I'm calming down. The kickoff was at noon. My college roommate and I were sitting there watching it. And right after the kickoff, it wasn't getting better. So I told him, I said, uh, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. You can stay here, but I've got to see what's going on. So my wife took me to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the ramp up the back, I was starting to walk up that, and I could not walk up that, get all the way up that ramp without losing breath. And I was really worried then. I said, something is wrong. We get in the emergency room. They immediately did the EKG and did the test. And they came in there and they said, Tommy, it appears that you're having a heart attack. We're going to prepare you and take you to Duke. 
Well, we get in the ambulance and we're riding down to Durham and there's lights flashing and I'm looking out and I'm saying, well, Tommy, you've never been the healthiest eater in the world. You're going to get over there, they're going to do a catheterization and they're going to find a few blockages and you'll have a couple of stints and you'll be home in a week. And that was my hope. But then I also started thinking, I said, what if it's worse than that? What have I left undone, spiritually and with my business? And that started waiting on me then about different things that uh, I had not prepared for if this was that big of an emergency. We get, to the mer we get to Duke, and boy, when the ambulance backed up, you've never seen so many folks in your life. I, I love Duke Hospital. They were ready, and they pulled me in, out with, and took me straight to the catheterization lab. And I remember to this day, I don't remember much as the catheterization was going on, but I remember this voice that they, they have a speaker behind this glass thing coming up and says, Mr. Humphreys, we want you to see this one time more before we take you out to your room. And I said, well, what am I looking for? And they says, there's no su su uh, significant blockage in your heart uh, to be caused in your heart to do what it's doing. And the young man was standing beside me. I said, what does that mean? He says, you're a very sick man. Well, it started, they took me to intensive care. They started medications. Uh, Doctors were coming in. One nurse says, who are you? I said, why? She said, every doctor in this hospital, in this, in this medical school is coming looking at you. I find out later, they, it was such a rare. I, had, I ended up being diagnosed with giant cell myocarditis. It was a rare disease, and no one knew what exactly was going on. I got better for the first couple of days with meds. Things got better. But on a Sunday night, September the 9th, things went for the worse. These my sur the surgeon on our team, he called his uh, group in for a, a medical procedure on, on Sunday night, on September the 9th. And my wife asked him, and said, she said, well, this must be serious. He said, yeah, I wouldn't be bringing them in on Sunday night if it wasn't serious. They were going to put me on an LVAD to help pump the heart. Well, after they got in, they found out the LVAD was not strong enough to support me. So then they decided to put two. I had a right and a left. And it was tied to a 400-pound machine. I had four tubes coming at the rings of this machine that was almost like an artificial heart that was pumping my heart. And I found at that time it was to be waiting for a heart transplant. So that went well. I went back to intensive care for another couple of weeks and finally got out. During that time, I had a lot of dreams, visions, or whatever. You're medicated, you're weak, and there's a lot of things. Some of them were crazy. One dream I didn't have is I, while I was sitting in intensive care, I remember my uh, brother-in-law coming in to visit. I don't remember what he said, but he came in and sat down beside me, and we visited. And I don't remember anything he said, but I do remember him getting leaving and going to the door and coming back to my bed and kissing me on the forehead and said he loved me. I grabbed the side of the bed then because I knew I really was sick. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was some experience. But the dreams that I had, like I say, some of them were with that past things in my life and some other things. But there's one that stood out and it still stands out this day almost 14 years later. This dream was... All of a sudden, I was in something like a tunnel, but it was the brightest colors I've ever seen in my life. I remember how clean and, and fresh everything was, something I had never experienced. Beautiful. Someone was leading me through this tunnel. We get to a loading ramp, and there was two ramps like in a subway, and he says, go ahead and take one. And I said, turned around, I said, well, which one do I take? He said, one, if you take, you will have a heart transplant. The other one, if you take, you'll be happy and at peace and happier than you have ever been in all your life. I honestly believe it was a message sent to me that God was with me, that no matter what happened, 
that he was there to hold my hand. And it made a difference. I'm the type of person, when I was growing up through school, I was the type of person that every medical school, Dr. Show, Dr. Welby, there were two or three medical, they would have the disease of the week. But when I went to school the next day, I had those symptoms. So I always was one that worried. And no one in my family thought at that time that I could, I could take the different things that were going to happen and that I would be going through for this two-month period waiting for the heart. But with that vision or that dream, I was at peace. They, never, they, just, they saw something in me that they had never seen before, that it was just a peace there that let me get through all. I learned a lot from that. Not only did I get a new heart, but I got a new spirit. I learned when, I, when people are on our prayer list, not only do I pray for healing, I pray for that person to feel the hands of God, that they will uplift them and carry them through to good health. It makes such a difference to know that God is with you. And I think all of us in our prayer life, we should remember that, that we pray, pray for healing, but also pray for comfort and, came and pray for finding of the Spirit and finding God's hand, hands that will guide us through that. You know, while I was in the hospital, one thing about being an elected official and being in a, in a smaller county is like Person County. When they, the ministers from Person County were visiting their folks at Duke, well, they knew me because we had contact, seen each other over the years, and they would come by the room. So I was constantly having pastors coming by having prayer, and it meant a lot. And I, one day I know we had at least four, four ministers came by and prayed that one night that came through, each one coming through. Well, I had a 24-hour sitter because with those tubes coming out of my chest into this machine, I was trying to get out of bed not knowing it, and they wanted somebody to stay there 24 hours watching and keep me in the bed. Well, that sitter, that sitter she got so excited, she says, I'm going to give you a prayer. So she looked at the door and made sure nobody was ready. She closed the door and got the family all together held hands, and she gave us a prayer. And I was so appreciative of it. Prayer means a lot in your life. But it, it was a, a great experience to have a lay person. That's why I say laity are very important in all of, all of our lives. But every day, uh, there was one scripture that my wife read to me every day. And we still read each day now because it meant so much to you. And it was Isaiah 12, chapter 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. How much that meant to me and us, us to get, take us through this time. The heart has been great. As I say, November 1st, I will celebrate 14 years. When, we, when I, the day I checked out of the hospital, they give you this book or manual of do's and don'ts in a transplant life. And it, if you read everything, it scares you to death. They show you all the side effects of the medicines you're taking, how you have to be careful being around sickness and disease and people with infections and all these things. But when you finally go through everything in there, right toward the end, there's one line. You have received a precious gift. Go out and give back to your community. And I have taken that to heart. And I have volunteered, I've volunteered at Duke to see patients that are in, a, that are in similar situations I'm in. I've been very involved in the local church and now right now I'm involved in the district church. But it's something we all need to know. The gift of life is very precious. It's very important to all of us. And I thank God for everything that he has given me. I thank y'all for listening and God bless y'all.
Amen. my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true, cause I am I am found, I am yours, I am loved, I'm made pure, I have life, I can breathe, I am healed, I am free, cause you are strong. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
offering today will uh, you'll be able to access the offering plates on your way out um, but if the usher will come forward uh, we will recognize it here and blessings that you have bestowed upon us and to this community and to this church. We give you thanks. We return a portion of those now that may extend your ministry here in the district, in the conference, and into the world. We thank you for these blessings, and may they be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess since 2009, a large part of our church um, prays over prayer quilts for folks who are in need of prayer every week. Well, sometimes, not every week, but a lot of the time. So in, in doing that now, I'd like to read the name of the recipients of our four quilts this week. Martha Niles from Eflin, who will be having surgery due to collapsed disc in her neck on October the 18th. Martha is a member who helps make a lot of these prayer quilts and a member of Prayers and Squares and a Walnut Grove Crafter. Dawson Laws from Caldwell is recovering from injuries sustained in a truck accident. He is the son of Mike Skinny Laws and the great nephew of Evelyn Berry. Karen Hawkins for sale, Miss Alma Hawkins' youngest daughter, who is having some health issues. She is the sister of Sandra Hawkins I mean, Sandra Hicks and Jerry Hawkins. Carolyn Cates from Hillsboro is the daughter of Marshall, Marshall Cates, who's in ICU at Duke. She's a friend of mine and a co college, not college, high school um, grad graduate together. So let us go to God in prayer for not only the four quilt recipients, but for our people on our prayer list today, for Carl Taylor, brother of Sue Powell, for Janice Hall, who is battling cancer and other health issues, for Gary Cage from Erie, Pennsylvania, who is a farmer recovering from a stroke, for baby Henry Lynch from South Carol Sanford, North Carolina, uh, who is, has heart surgery, for Betsy Garrett, who has cancer, for David True, diagnosed with cancer, and for Tish Nowak and her family as her father goes through treatments. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for bringing us safely to your church today. Today, We gladly surrender our lives to you in worship and praise. As we gather, we remember those who are not with us today. For those who are sick, we ask for healing. For those who have had surgery, we ask for healing. For those who are having surgery, guide surgeons' hands and hope for a quick recovery. For those who are grieving, give them comfort and peace. For those who are away from us, we ask for your blessings to be on them. We invite your Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Come dwell in our, each of our hearts. Equip us, challenge us, comfort us, teach us, 
inspire us as we learn more about your ways. Let us pray the, together the Lord's the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power forever. Amen. Obviously not Jack DiCaprio. <laughs> um, I'm Margaret Ann Dow, and I have the honor of talking to you about a ministry I met this morning. Before COVID, um, we had a wonderful women's Sunday school class known as the Faithful Followers. This class served the women of Walnut Grove in many ways. We studied scripture through different sources. We listened, cared, and supported each other. At times, we cried with each other. We prayed for each other and any concerns of the group. We felt so blessed to have our class. Because of COVID and the pandemic, we were no longer able to meet in person. However, God is with us always. The Holy Spirit encouraged us to stay connected through technology. We have a group text which has allowed us to keep in touch with each other. Since the last time we sat in our circle, we have continued to share joys and concerns, 
support each other, and pray for each other. God has sustained us through a global pandemic, and we are so thankful. It has been two and a half years since we have physically been together in a class. Stepping out in faith and God willing, we are coming together again. Last week, we met for the first time since March 2020 in the park in our circle of love and fellowship. It was so special to be together again. We graciously invite any woman to visit us. You will be welcomed with open arms. We believe God celebrates our fellowship and is ever present in the midst of our circle of women, supporting each other, sharing our faith, and eager to learn more about him. From Matthew 28, 20, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Praise God. Looking forward to a day when we don't hear those words before COVID. Um, but before COVID, <laughs> when, when we're about to do the benediction that, um, that I've chosen, it was the UMYF benediction, and it would be nothing to have everybody stand up and make a big circle, and you know, you cross your arms, and you're not you're sure if you're on the top or the bottom, and then you do that little twisty thing in the outside. We're not gonna do any of that, but I do invite you to remember um, how it was before COVID. Please stand as you are able for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.